Hi guys, uh, welcome back to our online meeting. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Lissandra's here, May's here, Harmon, and then Christine. So very good, guys. Uh, so keep checking. And I remember every time you do this live with me, you get three points on the test. And then when you guys are doing this as a recorded session, you get two points on the test. So if you didn't record it, make sure to put a comment and in the comment box at the very end of the, uh, I mean, below the video. So that's how I know you are here. And also remember that uh, when you leave uh, your name on there, then make sure to tell me that your your screen name is your uh, your actual name. Otherwise, let me know who you are. So it's hard to guess who you are based on your screen name. Okay. Hi, Jojo. Um, Jojo, this. <laughs> um, you know what, Jojo is okay. Go back to work. Um, this will last about an hour or so. So. Um, but you know, I I count you here because you guys hear the things for the online meeting. Um, you don't have if you if you can't, you don't have to stay for the entire session. So you can check in when you can and then leave you if you if you need to. Okay. Um. So guys, does anybody have any questions over uh last week stuff or any question regarding to the class, um, homework or quizzes? <laughs> All right, let me move forward. Uh, there's a delay in, uh, in my, on my side, your side. Uh, so anybody have any, any questions? OK, so if no questions, we're going to start the lecture for this week. So for this, we have two chapters, chapters three and chapter four. Now, chapter four is pretty simple, just most definitions. Uh, but chapter three is really, really important, uh, especially for this class. So. So guys, what I'm going to do for, for this week, I will go over chapter three with you. And then if you guys have any questions on chapter four, just email me and I'd be more than happy to answer questions. So uh, let me start my screen sharing. All right, and then let's talk about chapter three. All right, so chapter three, is the fundamental of supply, demand, and the market. Oh, guys, for those of you who are here live with me, if you have any questions during the lecture, um, you want to ask me live, just put your question in the comment box, in the chat, uh, in the live chat box. I will answer them when I see it. Okay. So, um, so chapter three, supply, demand. Now, first, uh, let's talk about um, what is supply, demand. So, for every economy. Um, we're going to try to answer three questions. The questions are is what to produce, how to produce them, and then um, let me start. So what to produce, how to produce, and then who to give it to. So for these three questions, uh, remember from chapter one that there are two types of uh, economic structures. We have the market economy, which is our society here. So US economy is a market economy. And then we also have something called a command and control policies. So that's more like the, uh, the North Korea, uh, Soviet Russia, where the government control everything. So for our economy in this market economy, is the supply and demand in this market that will make everything worse. So let's look at how um, our participants in the marketplace. So we have three participants. We have consumers, business, and government. Now, the goal of every single consumer is to maximize our utility. Now, uh, utility is just a term for um, happiness. So, so how how happy you are when you consume a good and service. So, the goal for every single consumer is to maximize our happiness given our uh, limited income and limited resource. And then, for business, their goal is to maximize profit. So, whatever they do, the this is the bottom line for every company is to maximize profit. So if you increase your profit, you do it. If you decrease your profit, you don't do it. And then the goal for the government, this can be argued, depends on who you are. But uh, a, a general understanding for government is that they would try to maximize the general welfare of the society. So try to make the society better. Not exactly how, that depends on which party you're talking about. Okay, But the goal is to make sure the society is better. All right, so three participants here. Um, so trade, no, that's not important. No, so circular flow diagram. Um, this is important. I do believe there are a couple questions like this on your test and on the quizzes. So, um, so for the circular flow diagram, you're gonna put all the parties into one picture, and I'm gonna see how uh, how resource and also how money flow in the market. Um, so for this diagram, we have or for this circular flow diagram, we have two market. 
where the market for factor productions and the market for um, for product. So for factor productions, this is what you need to produce good and service. So uh, remember what we learned: the uh, labors, capitals, uh, land, entrepreneurship, uh, resource. So all those resources we need to produce good and service, they are called the factor market. And then the product market, they're the stuff you buy from. So the good and service you buy every day. So your apples, bananas, computers, iPhones, your haircut. So good and service you buy from your business. That's the product market. So for consumers, our first participant here, for consumers, um, we own all the factory productions. So for example, labor. You know, who are the labor? Consumers wear the labor. So we're both labor and consumer at the same time. And we're going to supply our labor to business. So business will buy labor, okay, uh, or hire labor, and at the same time, well, well, for consumers, we're gonna buy good and service in the product market. So two different market, two different two different behaviors. Uh, in the factory market, consumer are the sellers that will sell our labor, and then in the product market, consumers were the buyer of good and service. And then companies on the other side, uh, companies they produce good and service in the product market. Uh, and on the other side, they will buy uh, the resource from the uh, factor market. Government, uh, government will acquire resource in the factor market. Now, um, imagine labor. So now even our government, they do hire people. So for all the people working in the post office, all the people working in the school, all the people working in the um, police department. So there are still laborers. So our government do hire laborers. Um, but government doesn't sell any good and service because there's, there's nothing you can buy from the government. I mean, really, if you think about it, you really just nothing can buy from government. So government doesn't provide any good and service. Only thing, I'm sorry, they don't sell any good and service. They do provide good and service, but they don't sell them. So government is not a is not a participant in the product market, but government is a participant in the factor market. And then lastly, we have our international participant. So for the international participant, this can be your foreign companies, your foreign consumers who buy and sell in both markets between factor and product market. Let me show you how this works, how this looks like. So, um, so first we have firms. Firms they will supply good and service in the product market, and consume uh, at the same time they will buy um, factor productions. So again, this is your labor. Uh, your capitals, your um, your raw material, and then for our consumers, we supply our factory productions. So we supply the labors and raw material, and then we're gonna get the money and we're gonna buy good and service from the product market. Government on the other side, government will hire factory production, they will hire labor, and then they will provide a service to both business and consumers. Because if you think about it, what kind of service is a company that does government provide? Um, oh, hey, Fall Miner, uh, make sure to tell me what your full name is. <laughs> it's hard to guess your uh, your 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 full name using your screen screen name. Okay, um, so so government does provide a service for both consumer and business, and then for our international participant, they are involved in both market, and then they're going to be participating using import and export. So import is anything produced uh, overseas, consumed domestically, and then export is anything uh, produced at home but consumed domestically. So if you think about it, like uh, even the car companies. So um, so you have um, we have BMW here. So BMW that's a German brand. So that's an uh, import to America. At the same time, if you go to if you go to uh, Germany, you're gonna find some American cars over there too. So there'll be an exporting market for us. So for an international participant, they're both doing import and export in both market. So they buy and sell both good and service and factory productions. Uh, if you look at the trade between U.S. and Canada and Mexico, um, one of the um, one of the uh, big export to Mexico from U.S. Is farm good, so corn, soybeans. That's number one export to, to Mexico. So, so there are participants overseas. Okay, so this is the circle for diagram. Um, and then next, let's skip this. Let's talk about the market. So, market is anywhere you have buyer and seller come together and then they exchange. That's a marketplace. 
And then a market is more than a physical locations. Uh, market nowadays, they're online now, so they don't, they're not in any physical location anymore. So really the biggest market today, there are websites like uh, eBay, Amazon, they're the biggest market which they don't exist in any physical place, but all on, online. And then for the market, um, let's look at supply and demand. So supply is the ability and willingness to sell a specific quantity of good and alternative prices in a given time period. So supply is how many stuff you want to sell and you're both willing and able to sell at different price level, that's called supply. And then demand is the opposite, is the ability and the willingness to buy at different price and quantities uh, given the price level. Now this term here called citrus paribus, it's Latin. It means um, everything else equal. Um, and do have a question here. So May asked me, we have to come in with our full name in order to get extra credit. Um, May, uh, if, you are, if your username, if your screen name for YouTube is similar to your real name, and I can guess who you are, you don't have to tell me what your full name is. But let's say, uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, Bloom Spark 14, I don't know who that is. So Lang, very good. So tell me who you are, okay? Um, all right, so again, citrus paper is Latin. Uh, it means everything else equal. Now, what that means, that means if I give you a problem in economics, especially for this, uh, this early chapters, only take the information I'm giving to you. Assume nothing else change. So the only thing change is the factor given to you. And which means, you know, if you're gonna think about a problem, stay in the box. Right. Don't do not think outside the box. Stay in the box. And then really right now for you guys, you have a very small box to think about. Okay, so stay in the box. Do not think outside the box. So if I ask you, um, so let's suppose that uh, I ask you when the price of uh, Coca-Cola increase, do you buy more, do you buy less? Well, all you think about is the price change. So don't think, do not think like this. Do not think like, uh, oh, you know, I don't like Coke. I don't buy Coke at all. Or, um, well, Coke's bad for me. Why even drink Coke? So don't think like that. Only thing about it, that everything else is the same. The so only thing change is the price. Do you buy more, do you buy less? Okay, so citrus paribus, Latin, means all, everything else equal. All right, um, and let's look at our demand first. So demand, we're gonna start with law of demand. So law of demand says, in a given time period, the quantity demanded of a good increases as the price fall, and citrus paribus, and vice versa. So. So when the price of the good falls, the quantity demanded of the good increases. Well, this is actually, uh, it's pretty common sense, guys, if you think about it, um, because when everything becomes cheaper, now remember, such as purpose, so nothing else change. So same location, same quality, same color, same everything. So only thing change is the price is getting cheaper, and then guess what? We do buy more, right? And then vice versa. If the price goes up, so everything becomes more expensive, then what do we do? We buy less. So law of demand is very common sense. Just says price goes up, we buy less. Price goes down, we buy more. And then because of this, um, when you draw your demand curve, uh, your demand curve is a two-dimensional curve, uh, so x and y's, and it's always price on the vertical axis and then quantity on the horizontal axis. And then over here we said when the uh, when price goes down, quantity demanded goes up, and then vice versa when the price goes up, quantity demanded goes down. So between price and quantity, they have an inverse relationship. So one goes up, the other comes down. So because of this inverse relationship, that this is if you guys remember your your algebra one class or college algebra, uh, when you have an inverse relationship, uh, you can have you can have a negative slope. So your demand curve is always downward sloping. Now, sometimes, not always, but sometimes you might see a vertical demand curve, you might see a horizontal demand curve, you might see a downward sloping demand curve, but you will never see a upward sloping demand curve. Okay, so it's only either downward sloping, vertical, or horizontal. All right, and then um, the difference between the market demand and the individual demand, the market demand, it's just the sum of all individual demand curve. So uh, let's suppose right now in the market we have um, we have four people. 
we have May, we have Lang, we have uh, Herman, and then Emmanuel. And then let's suppose the price of a bottle of water is one dollar. So if each one of you willing to buy one bottle, so that's your individual demand. But for the market demand, we're gonna add up everything all together. So everybody all together. So between four people, we have four bottle of water that's been demanded. That's your market demand. So the market demand is the sum of all individual demand curve. Okay. Well, that's a <laughs> that's an ugly summation. So it's a sum of all individual demand curve. All right, so let's see how this demand curve looks like. So again, uh, when you draw demand curve, it's always price on the vertical axis and then quantity on the horizontal. And then you plot all the points in. So this line here, that's called demand curve. So as you see, demand is always downward sloping, okay? Um, there are a couple of factors that can uh, shift our demand curve. So um, we can also call this these five factors our demand shifter. So anytime when this five factor change, we're gonna shift our demand curve. Uh, so the factors are taste, income, expectation, price of other good, and also number of buyers. So let me add price over here. So it's the price of other good. Um, and then when it's increasing your demand, you'll be shifting to the right. When it's decreasing your demand, you'll be shifting to the left. Now let me teach you guys a trick. So something you can do at home and also in your other classes. Um, so let me stop screen sharing for now. All right, so guys, if you if you want to uh, do this with me, so take your hand out like this, okay? Um, so first, um, take out your left thumb uh, and then take out your, uh, your right pinky. So they're both pointing to the left. So this will be in decreasing to the left, okay? So let's put it back. And then next, take out your right thumb and then your left pinky. So now they're both, in, both pointing to the right. So this will be an increasing, okay? So um, guys, let's do it together. So put everything back. So when the demand is increasing, we'll be shifting our demand curve to the right. So pointing to the right. All right, and then put it back. When demand is decreasing, we'll be shifting to the left. So left. All right, let's do it faster, okay? So increasing to the right, decreasing to the left, to the right, to the left, increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease. All right, so guys, if you want to go home, I mean, at home or at work, practice, okay? Um, so I mean, remember, if it's increasing, it's to the right. If it's decreasing, it's to the left. Okay, all right, so let's continue. All right, so if demand is increasing, again, it's shifting to the right. If demand is decreasing, it will be shifting to the left. Now, for these five factors, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about these five factors. So for taste, um, every time consumer taste change, this will change our demand for the good. Um, so let me tell you guys a story. There is a, um, there is a diet, a very famous diet, it's called Aiken Diet. Um, many of you probably heard it before. So Aiken Diet, it basically says, um, now by the way, this, this, was, this was like the diet in America back in the, uh, the late 90s and early 2000s. So everybody was on it. So Aiken Diet says that you can, eat, you can eat whatever you want. So all the butter, all the meat, all the fat, all the seafood, whatever you want, except carb. So don't eat carb. So no bread, no rice, no flour, no corn. So this actually works. So many people are losing weight. Now, again, but this is not a healthy way to do it. Because even though you're losing weight, but you're still you, you're, you're high in fat, high in sodium. So you're still having like a bad cal calories. So that's still bad for you. But many people are losing weight. Uh, and then there is a, a bread company. Uh, they sell loaf of bread. It's called Miss Beard. Um, now you guys go to, you've got to go to Walmart, H-E-B. When you got to go to the bread section, you're going to see a Miss Beard brand of bread over there. So Miss Beard, the, their sales in 2001 decreased by 30%. All of the blue, just all that happened, all, all of a sudden the, the, the sales for the entire company lowered by 30%. And then company was freaking out. I mean, what's, what's going on? We didn't do anything differently. It's still the same bread. We still do, we still sell the same price. Well, how come nobody buys this anymore? Well, the reason why is because our consumer taste changed. 
So everybody was on this Aiken diet. Nobody was eating carb. No, nobody was eating bread. That's why the company sales decreased by thirty percent. So that will be a decrease of demand, which means demand curve will be shifting to the left. Okay. So in, again, increasing to the right, decreasing to the left. Now for consumer income, uh, anytime consumer income change, this will cause change our demand level too. Uh, but normally, you know, we think that when consumer income is increasing, we buy more stuff, or when consumer income is decreasing, we buy less stuff. Um, but there's there's a difference between what is called a normal good, normal good, and inferior good. So normal good, um, they're the stuff that you buy more. Did I spell normal correctly? Uh, yeah. Sorry for the handwriting, guys. So normal, still pretty bad. So normal good uh, is anything you buy more when income goes higher, that's normal good. And inferior good is anything you buy more when income goes down, that's inferior good. Uh, so one example of inferior good, uh, you can think like uh, the ramen noodle. Ramen noodle will be actually inferior good. Because for ramen noodles, uh, you know, we buy it because we have no money, right? So, so income goes up, you don't buy ramen noodle anymore. But income goes down, you have no money now, then guess what, we buy more ramen noodle. So ramen noodle is an inferior good. So when you think about this income change, think about what kind of good it is. this is. If it's a normal good, when income goes up, you buy more. When it's inferior good, when income goes up, you buy less. And the next is your expectation. So it's a consumer expectation on the future prices or the future income will have impact on today's level. So if you expect that tomorrow price is higher, today what do you do? You're gonna buy less, I mean, you're gonna buy more because tomorrow is more expensive. So uh, so if you, oh, by the way, if anybody here who smokes cigarette, um, you guys know how, like cigarettes are five, six dollars per pack. Um, the reason why it's so expensive is that uh, a lot of what you pay for a cigarette, about half what you pay over here, is going to cigarette tax. And uh, every time when our state government is increasing the cigarette tax, we always do it on Monday morning. But we always an announce this ahead of time. So we tell the public, saying, hey, everybody, you know, by next Monday morning, there will be a $1 higher tax on cigarette. And then the Sunday night before the price increase, you can always find lines also the gas stations people buying cigarette before the price increase. So if you expect that tomorrow price is higher, today I buy more. Uh, and then vice versa, if you expect that tomorrow price is lower, then today I buy less. I mean, that's why nobody do their shopping like the week before Black Friday, right? because if you expect Black Friday price is cheaper, then today I buy less, tomorrow I buy more. And then the next determinant is the price of other good. So again, you need, to know, you need to know what kind of good this is. So it's either substitute or complements. So substitute, you buy one, you don't buy the other one. Complements, you buy them together. So for substitute, you can think like between iPhone and Galaxy, they are substitute good. You buy one, you don't buy the other one. So when the price for iPhone is increasing, um, now according to law of demand, when iPhone getting more expensive, we buy less iPhone. At the same time, we're gonna buy more Galaxy. So demand for Galaxy will be increasing if the price for iPhone is increased. And then if the two good are complements, so let's suppose between uh, computers and softwares. So if the price for computer is increasing, we buy less computers. At the same time, we buy less softwares. So demand for software goes down, okay? And the last one is number of buyers. So when number of buyer change, this also shift our demand curve. Uh, so if there are more number of buyers, mm -hmm. demand shifting to the right, if less number of buyers, demand shifting to the left. Okay. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions right now? No? Okay. All right. Um, so also know the difference between the change in quantity demanded and then change in demand. So a change in quantity demanded. This only happens when there is a price change. So when the price of a good change, we call this change in quantity demanded. And when this happens, you don't shift your curve. You're gonna move on the same curve. So let's suppose I have a demand curve. We go from point A to point B. 
So this will be a change in quantity demanded. Now, a change in demand is anytime you have those five factor change. So the one I just talked about those uh, this five factors over here. So when this five factor change, we're going to be shifting our demand curve, and then if it's increasing, remember you'll be shifting to the right. If it's decreasing, you'll be shifting to the left. Okay, so increasing to the right, decreasing to the left. All right, so we talk about this, and the next supply. So supply is very similar to demand, but everything reversed or opposite. So law of supply says the quantity, uh, the quantity of goods supplied it in a given time period increases as the price increases. So when price increase, quantity supplied it increase, and then vice versa when price decrease, quantity supplied it will decrease as well. So they both go together now, and then this is a direct relationship. When you have a direct relationship, your slope is positive. So for the for the supply curve. Uh, it's always upper sloping. So supply curve, when you draw it, again, you know, price and quantity on the axis, supply curve looks like this. So it's always going up, okay? Um, so if you draw it over here, um, that's your, quant so when the price is 50, our quantity supply is 20, and then when the price is uh, 30, quantity supply is 10, and then draw the line, that this upper sloping curve, that's your supply curve. And then, guys, um, if you see P here, P stands for price, um, Q stands for quantity, and then S stands for supply, and then QS stands for quantity supplied. It. So, how many do we supply different price level? Uh, for supply, you have six factors that can cause a shift in your supply curve. So, first, technology. Um, when technology change, this will change our supply. And then for supply, it will be the same change. If it's increasing supply, you'll be shifting to the right. If it's decreasing supply, you'll be shifting to the left. So when this five, when this six factor change, this will change our supply. So first is the price as the technology. So anytime technology improve, uh, supply will increase. And then uh, second is factor cost. This is also known as the production cost. So anytime production cost is increasing, company profit goes down, then supply decrease. And then vice versa, when the production cost is decreasing, profit goes higher, then production will be increasing, and then supply increase, and the supply curve shifting to the right. Uh, next one is tax and subsidy. So tax uh, is anytime you do something, you're going to pay money to the government, that's a tax. Uh, a subsidy is like a negative tax. <laughs> um, so, so, so which means that if you do something and government government pay you the money for it, that's a negative tax or a subsidy. Um, so anytime you have a tax, supply decrease. Every time you have a subsidy, the supply will increase because with more subsidy, that pretty much means your profit is higher. So at a higher profit, company have more incentive to produce more. Uh, next one is expectation. Uh, so next expectation, um, oh, I got a question here. C. John, C. Jing. Uh, C. Jing, do me a favor, let me know what's your full name so I, I can give you the actual credit for it. Um, now, if you cannot attend any live meeting that you, you need, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna do the recorded session, um, the time frame is one week. So anytime from the end of meeting today, until the start of meeting next week. So for this one week, you have time to comment on the videos. Okay. Um, all right. So and then expectation. Expectation that if you ex for for companies, expectation play the same deal. So for companies, if they expect the future price is higher, then today they will produce less and tomorrow produce more. And then vice versa, if you expect that the future price to be uh, lower, then today they're going to produce more and tomorrow produce less. Um, next one is the other good, the, the price of other good uh, will also affect company supply level for each good. So uh, if you guys could think about, let's say between Coke and Pepsi, no, I'm sorry, Coke and Sprite. So any idea which company produced Coke? I mean, duh, Coca-Cola, right? Coke produced Coke. Uh, and then Coke also produced Sprite as well. So for Coke, they have a choice. They can produce either Sprite or 
Coke. Uh, and then if the price for Coke is increasing, so for, for some reason, Coke are more expensive now, so company can get more money by selling Coca-Cola, and then Coca-Cola will produce more Coke. At the same time, they're going to switch production from Sprite to Coke, so Sprite production goes down, so supply for Sprite goes down, and then the supply for Coke goes up. Okay, so this is a choice for the com for the companies. Whichever price change, that if your Coke getting more expensive, the com company produce more Coke and then produce less Sprite, and then vice versa. If Coke become cheaper, then company produce more uh, Sprite and less Coke. And last one is number of sellers. So number of seller changes also have an effect on our supply curve. Uh, so more number of sellers, supply will increase. Less number of sellers, supply will decrease. So let me see. and then make sure you know this difference too. The difference between the change in quantity supplied and change in supply. So again, a change in quantity supplied, just like change in quantity demanded, is only when there's a price change. And this happens, you're gonna move on the same supply curve. So if you let's say you go from point A to point oh, to point B, this will be a change in quantity supplied. Now, if you do a change in supply, this that's when those six factor change. So um, an increase, you be, oh, that's a demand curve. Let's ignore this. So um, an increase will be shifting to the right. A decrease will be shifting to the left. So it's always that way. Okay. So if increase shifting to the right, and then decrease shifting to the left. All right. So your Demand curve is always going down, supply curve is always going up. That means eventually these two lines they will meet. And this intersection here is the whole reason why we study supply demand. So once they meet, we call this point the equilibrium. And then now this equilibrium has some very special properties. Because the first property is that at this equilibrium, that your quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied. So how much is being produced by the companies uh, are consumed by consumers, and how many consumers want to buy are produced by the companies. So quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied. And another important character for this point here, equilibrium, is that the equilibrium also give you the market price and market quantity. So once you know what the equilibrium is, at this price level, this is the price for the market now. So wherever they meet, wherever the intersection is, they will determine what the price is for the market. And then we'll also get what is the quantity for the market. And the last, the last characteristic for this equilibrium is that the equilibrium is also the most stable solution for the market. That anywhere you, anytime you're away from equilibrium, you go back to equilibrium. So suppose uh, our current price is not equilibrium, our current price is at this point here, Let's call this one P1. So at P1, your price is very high. And if you look at it, uh, if you go from this point that you're on the supply curve, so this is your quantity supplied. And then on the demand curve, this is quantity demanded. So quantity supplied is more than quantity demanded. Uh, this is called a surplus. That means we have too much good, okay? So when you have a surplus, the company produce too much of it, then you're gonna have some company who are stuck with this good that nobody wants to buy. And then what are they gonna do with it? Just left it along in the warehouse? Or they might want to lower the price, right? So when they lower the price, your price is lowered, and you go back to equilibrium. So when you have a surplus, uh, that means too much supply, not enough, de not, not enough demand, there will be some downward pressure on the prices. So price will go back to equilibrium. And then vice versa, if you have a price too low, so let's call this one P2, at a lower price now, so this point on the demand curve, that's your quantity demanded. This point on the supply curve, that's your quantity supplied. So now quantity demanded is more than quantity supplied. This difference here is called a shortage. So when I have a shortage, um, eventually the price will be higher now because you have too many consumers who want to buy the good but couldn't buy it because there's not enough of it. So the price will bid higher, 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 and eventually you go back to equilibrium. Okay. Um, let me see. 
So again, so anytime your your price is above equilibrium, this is called a surplus. That because your quantity supplied is more than quantity demanded, and price too high, uh, and then vice versa. Anytime if you are below this equilibrium, so anywhere over here, that uh, your supply is more is less than demand. This is called a shortage and price too low, and then eventually price will go back up. Um, let me see what else we can talk about. There's one more section we're gonna talk about that's important for this class. Should we talk about this? All right, let's talk about this. But this is important. All right, so you're gonna see some question like this on the test um, where I give you a market and I introduce some some change to you and I ask you how this will affect our price and quantity. So first, let's see if a demand increase. Now remember, for demand supplies, if it's increase, will be shifting to the right. If it's decreasing, it'll be shifting to the left. Now, when you guys working on a problem like this, um, I always want you to start with a blank supply demand graph. So something like this. So always start with like this. You have one supply curve, one demand curve, and label the price and quantities. And then next, we're going to introduce a change to it. So to increase our demand, demand will be shifting to the right. So we're going to shift our demand curve to the right. So let's call this one D2. At D2, you're going to have a new equilibrium. So this intersection here is our new equilibrium that's so called E2. So at a new equilibrium, you're going to have a new price, so P2, and a new quantity, at Q2. And then next, you compare your price and quantities. So P2 is more than P1, which means price is increasing. And then Q2 is more than Q1, which means quantity is increasing as well. So demand increase, demand curve shifting to the right, and then price goes up, quantity goes up. And then next, demand is decreasing. So let's shift it to the other direction. So shifting to the left, so D2. At D2, this is your new quantity Q2, new price P2. So looks like price is going down, quantity is going down. Okay. Um, and then next, let's look at our supply. So, so again, start with a blank supply, supply demand curve. So supply increase, uh, this will be shifting to the right. So again, guys, don't think about up and down. This is all left and right. If it's increasing, you'll be shifting to the right decreasing, shifting to the left. So this is our equilibrium. Draw the line. This is P2. This is Q2. So price is going down, quantity is going up. And the last one, uh, if your demand is decreasing, so shifting to the left, that's a decrease, that's two. All right, so which means that price is going up, quantity is going down. Okay, so make sure of this. So when the price decrease, uh, supply decrease, price goes up, quantity going down. All right, and then next, let's look at price control. So price control, we're going to learn what is a price ceiling and what's a price floor. So a price ceiling. Um, is the legal maximum price on a good and service. That's called price ceiling. A price floor is the legal minimum price. So, so for this legal maximum price, the price ceiling, when the price ceiling is below equilibrium, so this is equilibrium here, if a price ceiling is below equilibrium, we call this a binding price ceiling. But if a price ceiling is above equilibrium, we call this not binding. And the reason why it's not binding because it wouldn't cause any change in the economy. But if it's below the equilibrium, so below what, what you already is, you, what you already are, then uh, this would be a binding price ceiling. So let me give you an example. If, uh, guys, if you imagine that you're driving on um, uh, 59 
the the speed limit currently is what sixty five mile per hour. So that's that's the legal maximum. If you go over the speed limit, I, I know you guys do because I see you drive every day. So I know, but but you shouldn't do it. You should stay under the speed limit because speed limit is the legal maximum price. So if you if you have the speed limit, let's say we increase tomorrow. So tomorrow is not sixty five anymore. Tomorrow will be. Um, 150 mile per hour, so very fast. Now, would that mean you're gonna go over the limit too? Please don't, okay? Not really, because the thing is, if you're already behaving below the speed limit, when they increase even higher, you wouldn't change anything, because your, your current behavior is already okay. It's already below the legal maximum. But vice versa, if the legal maximum is set below what you're already doing right now, so imagine that you're going 60 mile per hour on highway every day, and then government says the new speed limit is 55 mile, 55 mile per hour. Well, guess what? Your current 60 is too high now. You're gonna lower your you're gonna lower your speed. So that we call a binding price ceiling. Because price ceiling too low, it will cause a change in the economy. So for this market, when it happened, uh, when you have a binding price ceiling, price will no longer be at equilibrium. Price will be at a new price ceiling. But at this price ceiling, this is our quantity demanded. This is our quantity supplied. So demand more than supply, then we'll have a shortage in the economy. Okay. So the downside of binding price ceiling, you have a shortage in the economy. And then for the non-binding price ceiling, nothing happens. Everything stays stay the same. Now for price floor, price floor is the legal minimum price. So for legal minimum price, this is reversed compared to your price ceiling. So for legal minimum price, um, now again, this is your equilibrium. When the price floor is above, this is a binding price floor. But when the price floor is below, this is not uh, not well, not binding. Okay, so not binding, nothing happens. So for this binding price ceiling, um, the price will be pushed higher. So this will be a new price now. At a new higher price, this is your quantity supplied on the supply curve, and then this is your quantity demanded on demand curve. So uh, supply is more than demand, then we call this a surplus. So the downside of a binding price floor, they be creating some surplus in the economy. So again, guys, remember um, for price ceiling, if it's binding price ceiling, you'd be creating some shortage. And then for the price floor, if it's binding, you'd be creating some surplus in the economy. Okay. Um, let me see. I think we're finished for this chapter. All right. That's it. So, um, does anybody have any any questions at this point? You want to ask me? Any questions, guys? Let me wait for a second. Okay, let me see who is here. Uh, we have Sandra, May, Herman, Christine, Jojo, uh, Christy, Priscilla, Emmanuel, Lane, and then C. James. C. James, I hope that's your that's your full name, C. James Chong. Okay. Um. All right, guys. So does anybody have any question for me? Oh, okay, so Priscilla, when you ask questions, just just like, um, if you wanna ask me a question, uh, you can ask a question just in the live chat box during the lecture, or you can, um, after the lecture is over, you can send me an email, uh, and I answer my email usually pretty quickly, okay? Um, so anybody have any questions before we finish today? No, no questions. All right, so guys, if uh, no questions, good luck on your homework. And then um, again, have any questions, ask me, send me an email. Uh, and if you need help on your homework, uh, again, uh, find me on Google Plus. We can do one-on-one -on -one tutoring on Google Plus. Uh, electricity socket. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, 
Okay, guys, um, have any question, let me know, okay? I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.